This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Mapper Forward's first on-demand workshop, How to Become a Coffee Consultant, available now online for you to learn at your own pace with a certificate available upon completion. Click the link in the show notes to access today for just 50 euros. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and welcome to episode two of a five-part series that is filled with delicious conversation. I have David Paparelli here. David, welcome back to the podcast. This is going to be really fun as we explore migration and uh, labor challenges that are happening in the supply chain. What are the challenges from the perspective of labor and migration that are happening? Wow. Yeah. I mean. Um... This is another massive topic in this series and uh, hard to cover with any kind of tax short, but we'll, we'll do our best, Lee. We will. <laughs> so, <laughs> Good luck to maybe, us. <laughs> maybe just, yeah, maybe just start the conversation. So uh, I think there's a, there's a couple different things going on here. One, um, there's, you see it in the global news constantly, this political instability, right? Um, mm-hmm. So in every single country, you have some level of political instability or political upheaval, um, that's either driven by economics or impacting the economics of that mm-hmm. country. Um, as the economic uh, situation in that country deteriorates, um, people don't have an option. So they migrate, mm-hmm. right? They, they leave and they try and go find better opportunities elsewhere. And, you know, what, what that means for, for coffee is, um, is coffee's rotting on the tree. So mm-hmm. coffee fruit is growing on these trees and no one's there to pick it anymore um, because uh, the labor that was, uh, reliable for, for decades and decades is now transient and it's gone. Um, mm-hmm. And so that becomes a problem. Um, the other issue I think that's worth talking about just briefly um, that is playing a role is this generational uh, handoff, right? Yeah. So agriculture um, is not the sexiest field to be in for the younger generation, right? And so you have the uh, the farming population that um, that is fifty years plus on average aging. in some places. It's aging, yeah, and 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 at some point you kind of age out of farming, and then who mm-hmm. do you pass your farm off? Well, it used to be um, the next generation, and now that doesn't exist either. And so you have these small to medium sized farms that are just uh, shutting down because they're aging out of of farming. And so I think you have this confluence of migration, and then Migration in terms of how we think of it politically, I'm moving mm-hmm. to a different country. And then you have this uh, migration to different fields, different occupations, and neither are inherently bad, but in the coffee supply chain, you know, that it means becomes a big problem. problems. Yeah. yeah. The vice president of the US um, went to Central America, I believe, to go and start conversations with governments there so that they could stop the migration that was happening from ag through these caravans mm. that were going up into where I used to live, uh, San Diego, and, and through Texas, those borders. So many caravans were turning up there, and when they surveyed them, a huge majority of them were coffee producers. Wow. And coffee pickers. So what the what they decided to do was to pick up and take delegations and go and try and solve some of the problems that are happening in agriculture and provide funding. That only happened at the beginning of this year. So I wonder what the flow and effect of that's going to be. Um, but from what I understand, El Salvador's lost two third two thirds of its pickers. Uh, wow. Which is huge. Like what do business owners do when that happens? The cost of production goes up because they have to – uh, labor becomes super short. We had a, a, a recently we had um, a coffee producer who's a, a client of mine, Abby from One Art Coffee, came on the podcast and did a series because they have a huge labor shortage over in the um, over in Hawaii for coffee pickers. And so what they decided to do was put out a call for interns from the coffee industry, a paid internship to work on a coffee farm in Hawaii and that's how they solved their labor problem. They had to get people from the industry to do it. (laughs) And, you know, shout out to everybody from the Mapplethorpe community that applied because they filled every position, which is fantastic. Um, 
and and perhaps there's an opportunity there for coffee producers to do something similar because I mean what a way to learn about the coffee supply chain um in such a way but to get people from the the consuming end of the industry to come and do internships for coffee producers around the world. Yeah, it's an interesting way to solve the problem. I mean, it, the sense that I'm I'm getting is not dissimilar. Um, you know, obviously in kind of manual labor like coffee picking, mm-hmm. um, you 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 traditionally have high levels of turnover, and that's yeah. just part of it, right? It's just part of the realities of of the industry and. And now that's no longer a luxury. You kind of have to mm. hold on to not just your good pickers, but all the pickers. It used yeah, to be, everything well, I want to hold get. on to the top 10% of my pickers because that's where my quality comes from, mm-hmm. right? And now it's, I need to hold on to all my pickers and how do I do that? And so I think, you know, internship programs could be one, but you, you could have kind of this, how do you how do you have your coffee pickers more engaged in ownership of the entire um, of the entire wow. production or the entire business and sort of a labor owned model. Is that a possibility? I mean, we, we have to start thinking creatively around mm. these issues. If two thirds of um, the, the handpicking population leaves overnight mm-hmm. um, it, from last harvest season to this harvest season, um, that's a major, major issue. And, and that requires some outside of the box thinking, I'd say. So I love the inter- internship model. Um, mm-hmm. But for small to medium sized coffee producers everywhere who, who who might who might not have access to that sort of model, what could you know? Again, we're just starting conversations, but is there some sort of level of ownership from pickers forward that they can start to have in order to be more engaged, or is there an equity play there to to share uh, to do profit sharing, or is there is there something um, to engage people more? There has to be, right? It's a super interesting approach to it because the alternative is mechanization. And in specialty coffee, mm-hmm. that's not a possibility because the pickers are so highly trained in order to pick the right cherries. So mechanization seems to be something that could be an alternative for commercial grade coffee. But in specialty coffee, the flow on effect of this labor shortage is a reduction in specialty coffee. Am I reading Absolutely. that right? Yeah, no, I think you're, I think you're spot on. I mean, so you can mechanize um, um, harvesting in places like Brazil where you have high flat plains. Mm -hmm. Um, But, but currently, and this might change, I mean, there's possibilities for all kinds of innovation. Et cetera, et cetera. Who knows? Um, But for the time being, it's really hard for um, these harvesting, this harvesting equipment to scale you know, 60 to 70 degree cliffs in order mm-hmm. to pick the coffee that's traditionally grown in most parts of the world, right? Yeah. It requires a, 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 an enormous amount of human effort to get that coffee off the tree. So um, unfortunately, we are, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, we're stuck with people. This is a human problem. And um, mm. and so it's not going to be solved by technology this year and, and maybe not for the next five to 10 with regards to your suggestion about um, profit sharing and and that kind of a, a business model, uh, c- culturally, do you think that that's something that they would be open to in, let's say, in Central and South America? I don't. I mean, there. It, it, I, I don't know the answer to that, and I'm probably mm-hmm. not the right person to speak on it. I will. Mm-hmm. I'll say that they are. You know. There's a long history of plantation sort of type ownership, right? Um, and um, in that, you you have kind of uh, two different classes in mm-hmm. in these in whichever country we're we're talking about. So you have large estate owners, and then they have pickers mm-hmm. and labor that that operate those those um, those farms. Well, now the labor didn't used to have an option. You know, I have to work here, otherwise there is no mm-hmm. work, and and it's kind of a you know, a virtue of their position and their geography and where they were born. And now the world is becoming a slightly smaller place where they do start to have an option, mm-hmm. right? They're moving to cities. Um, they're moving to different countries to seek better opportunities. Um, and that's becoming uh, frictionless in some ways, right? There's a there's a map forward. You know, you can Google online, how do I move from Guatemala to the yeah. U.S.? And you can, you can get that information. So... Um, so I think um, I think there does need to be a cultural shift in mindset. Some of that might be healthy. Some of that's probably going to be painful because mm-hmm. you're relinquishing ownership of something that your family may have had full ownership of for generations, right? 
mm-hmm. um, and and relinquishing that potentially to to a labor pool who you didn't have to think of that way as co-owners in an operation or partners in an operation before. So um, a culture will certainly play a large role, but this is where the younger generation could potentially come in if they'll stick around in the coffee industry. <laughs> right. Um, kind of older generation ideals move out and younger younger ones move in, right? Well, yeah, our friend Diego is the perfect example. He's the poster child of the next generation coming in and really innovating in the way that they are approaching coffee producing, which is, you know, again, I can't say enough great things about the way that he's approaching. It's a difficult situation he was put in and he has just thrived in it and it's super wonderful to see him set an example for the next generation of producers. Another part of the industry that is uh, experiencing labor challenges is the consuming end. Cafes and um, and roasteries are experiencing a lot of problems with regards to labor and um, I mean fortunately from that side of things that can be mechanized and it's most likely going to be mechanized. But in order for us to get there, a whole bunch of businesses are going to have to either decide we're going to invest in really expensive equipment or we're going to close down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and that, again, um, and we'll talk about this later on, I'm sure, in this series, but um, mm. but the role of technology 100%. in this. 100%. Um, it, it be, that investment in in those types of things, whether it's mechanized equipment on the barista end or mechanized equipment on the harvesting end, may become necessary, um, yeah. and it'd be the only way to move forward. And so that can be a good thing long term, but a very painful thing short term. Mm. Then you throw into the mix energy transition, climate change, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, it's going to be super interesting, which sets us up fantastically for a conversation on the price of coffee. <laughs> Join us in the next episode, folks. This just gets uh, uh, more interesting and more fun. I'm sure there's going to be a, a little bit of politics thrown into the next couple of episodes. So I'm sure that there are a whole bunch of people excited about that. Yay. <laughs> So thanks, David. We'll see you in the next episode, everybody. Peace, love, and peanut butter. Have an amazing rest of your day. Thanks for tuning in, friends. There are two ways you can support this podcast. Firstly, become a paid member of our YouTube channel. Secondly, you can join our Patreon for as little as $3 a month. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video before you leave and check the show notes for more information. Now, this is what you should check out next.